And as you're waiting, feel free to use the chat box to introduce yourself and say where you're calling in from. All right, let's get started, everyone. Uh, my name is Greta Zaro. I'm the organizing director with World Beyond War, and I'm so excited to be joining you today for this debate on the question of whether war is ever justified. Um, some Zoom logistics before we get started. Um, we are recording this webinar. We will send out the recording afterwards. So if you have to leave at any time, that's OK. And you can share the recording with your friends afterwards as well. Um, we also have the closed captioning feature on today. If you'd like to view the captions, you can click on the CC button at the bottom of your Zoom screen and enable the captions. You can also click on that button if you want to disable the captions. Um, and they are done by robots, so please excuse any errors in the captions, they are automated. Um, right now we do have the chat box open, so you can use the chat to introduce yourself and say where you're calling in from. Um, then after that, we will turn off the chat and it will just be for submitting questions. Um, and finally, today's webinar is set up uh, in a webinar style, quote unquote. Um, so we have video off and audio off for the participants, and we just have the videos on for the speakers and the moderators today. And with that, I will turn it over to Al Mitty, who is the chapter coordinator for World Beyond War Central Florida to introduce today's event. Well, thank you, Greta, and thanks to all of you who registered and have joined this event. As Greta said, I'm the coordinator for the Central Florida chapter of World Beyond War. We are one of the co-sponsors for this event. The other co-sponsor is Chapter 136 of Veterans for Peace here in the Villages, Florida, and that chapter is led by Larry Gilbert. Um, we are excited because we have more, we have people registered from over 35 countries in the world and six continents and time zones all over the world. So thank you very much for that. Thanks also to Greta for, uh, for from World Beyond War for her organizing and technical skills and to Elliot Lefkowitz, uh, who is from our World Beyond War Central Florida chapter for agreeing to be the timekeeper for this debate. Uh, Lastly, of course, thanks to uh, Mark Welton and David Swanson, whom I will introduce in a moment for agreeing to debate this important topic, can war ever be justified? The debate will follow this format. There will be opening remarks by both debaters for up to 10 minutes. Uh, Mark Welton has agreed to go first. Following the opening remarks, each debater will be allowed to ask the other one, uh, the other debater, one or two questions, and each will be given up to three minutes to respond to that question. Then we will present one or two questions suggested by you, the participants in the chat that Greta is monitoring, and each debater will be uh, allowed up to three minutes to respond to that question. And then each debater will be allowed up to nine minutes each uh, to, uh, to make closing remarks. And our timekeeper, Elliot Lef Lefkowitz, will announce when a speaker has 30 seconds left. Uh, we will also have two polling questions at the end, and we're going to open with a polling question as well. And then we will close the event, and this should, should put us right at 90 minutes or so for the total event. Um, so before we begin the debate and before I introduce the debaters, we have a polling question, and that question is, can war ever be justified? And Greta, if you want to put that up on the, on the screen now and let people respond, now would be the time to do so. The poll has been launched. I see people are voting. Thanks everyone for your responses. They're coming in fast. We'll leave this open a little bit longer. And by the way, we're not, we're not going to show you the, I think that's correct, Greta. 
we're not going to show them the results yet of the uh, of the debate uh, or of the polling question. Uh, we're going to ask that question again at the end of the debate, and then we'll show the responses. And then we have an, an additional question for you. All right. Some votes are still trickling in, but I think we're going to cut this off in a second. And as Al said, we will share the results afterwards. All right. Okay, so thanks for your responses. And now it is my privilege to, uh, to introduce the debaters. Um, both are experts on this topic. Uh, Dr. Mark Welton is Professor Emeritus at the United States Military Academy at West Point. He is an expert in international and comparative law, focusing on the U.S., European, and Islamic law. He is also an expert in jurisprudence and legal theory and constitutional law. He has authored chapters and articles on Islamic law, European Union law, international law, and the rule of law. He is a retired Lieutenant Colonel and was past Deputy Legal Advisor for the United States European Command and Chief International Law Division for US Army Europe. He holds a bachelor's degree from Stanford University, a master's in international relations from Boston University, uh, a JD from Georgetown University Law School, Master of Laws from the University of Virginia Law School and a Doctor of Science of Law, also from the University of Virginia Law School. David Swanson, the other debater, is an author, activist, journalist, and radio host. He is a co-founder and executive director of World Beyond War and campaign coordinator for RootsAction.org. His books include Leaving World War II Behind, 20 Dictators Currently Supported by the U.S., War is a Lie, and When the World Outlawed War. He blogs at davidswanson.org and warisacrime.org. He hosts Talk, uh, Talk World Radio. He is a Nobel Peace Prize nominee and was awarded the 2018 Peace Prize by the U.S. Peace Memorial Foundation. He holds a master's of philo master of philosophy degree from the University of Virginia. So both of our debaters have ties to the University of Virginia. So let's begin the debate with opening remarks by Mark Welton. Thank you, Al. Um, and I hope everybody can hear me fine. Um, and it's a privilege to be here and I expect to learn a lot. And hope I can present some ideas too for consideration. I think that's really the point of this. Um, just to summarize as a way of introduction, um, we all know that war has been endemic in the world since the world be, probably began. Uh, through most of history up until the 20th century, uh, war was commonplace. Um, philosophers, lawyers, uh, theologians, others, uh, all discussed war and generally speaking, and I'm, I'm really being a generalist here, it was kind of in the context of just war theory. What, what justifies war? What kinds of wars are just and what kinds of wars are not just? Um, that's more theoretical because uh, war continued whether it was just or not, but that was kind of the debate. Um, and uh, virtually every tradition that I've read from the ancient Greeks to the Islamic world to China, uh, Hebrew thought, theology and so forth talked in terms of just war theory. Um, as one of my professors at the University of Virginia Law School uh, said, and I, and I agree with this from other people who've commented, uh, that really changed in the 20th century. Just war uh, transitioned, uh, there's a, prominent Israeli scholar, uh, Yoram Dinstein, who said that uh, in the 20th century, war transitioned from jus ad bellum, that is the legal basis or legal grounds justification for going to war, uh, to use contra bellum, and that is law outlaw, outlawing war, forbidding war. And that was a transition that was, uh, I think, probably primarily a result of the change in warfare after World War I and certainly after World War II, and many people think that those, those were a continuum, uh, 
uh, the destruction uh, and the horrors of war was really brought out much more dramatically to the world uh, than in past centuries. And the horror of those two wars and the massive destruction led to, a, a th I think, a paradigm shift in, in thinking about war, that you can't justify war. War is, you can't go to war because it just, it's a just war. And this was encapsulated, and I'm speaking as a lawyer, and my perspective is primarily as an international lawyer, uh, in the United Nations Charter. And in the United Nations Charter in Article 2, uh, it says all members shall refrain in their international relations from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state. And back then, of course, they were thinking in terms of state versus state armed conflict. Um, that's basically uh, outlawing war. There were previous attempts in the 20th century to outlaw war, um, but they did not prevent the Second World War uh, and subsequent wars from occurring. But this was, this was a transition because the United Nations Charter is an international treaty to which, to which virtually every state uh, has acceded and therefore it is the law under international law. And for most countries, it is part of their domestic law as well. There is one exception to that and that's contained in Article 51 of the UN Charter, uh, which says that uh, nothing uh, in the Charter derogates from the inherent right of individual or collective self-defense against an armed attack. And so if you take the United Nations Charter as the current paradigm for can war ever be justified, uh, the answer is only in one particular case, and that is if you are subject to an armed attack, you have the right of self-defense. Uh, now, and that also includes individual or collective self-defense. The problem, of course, with that was this was uh, half a century, more than half a century ago. And uh, when you teach, and what I did a lot was what's called use in bellum, that is, the law that governs the actual conduct of war, war tends to uh, uh, accelerate faster than the law can catch up. And so there are exceptions. People, people states, scholars have uh, suggested exceptions to this. Um, one is protection of nationals. If you have nationals in another, another country, can you send an armed force in to protect those nationals? That was the justification for the US in Grenada. Another is a doctrine of humanitarian intervention. If there is a genocide or something approaching a genocide, does that justify uh, arm, the use of armed force from outside of that country to go in to prevent a genocide? Uh, scholars differ on this. Um, some suggest that yes, those are valid exceptions. Others says, say no, that this leaves the door wide open to interference and use of armed force where it's not justified. Um, the other major problem with, uh, that has occurred really since the UN Charter is the problem of self-defense itself. And that is the methods of warfare, particularly between states have accelerated to the extent that if a state feels that it is about to be subject to an armed attack, it's very seldom Ukraine may be being a very rare example currently, where you have one armed force that is apparently on the borders of another uh, set to uh, cross over into the territory. Uh, you know, the, the problem of nu uh, nuclear weapons where one state could attack another in a matter of minutes. So that's led to doctrines of preemptive self-defense and anticipatory self-defense. Preemptive self-defense, uh, can justify uh, a response before an armed attack if an armed attack uh, against that state is so imminent that it requires a response almost immediately. Anticipatory self-defense is another doctrine that some scholars in some countries accede to. And that is if there is a buildup of armed force and you have some evidence that in the near future, but not immediately, you are going to be attacked, then that justifies a response, an armed, armed response. Uh, there's an article by several scholars at the Hebrew University Genocide Prevention Program in Israel that, uh, and I can uh, give this to anybody who's interested in this particular article, that says 
that the defense of Israel, uh, because of its uh, the potential genocide uh, threat against Israel, justifies anticipatory and or preventive self-defense. That is the use of armed force to prevent an attack, whether that attack is imminent or or is likely to occur. Um, so there are. <laughs> There are uh, ex possible exceptions to the very limited doctrine contained in the UN Charter Article, Article 51 that says the only justification for going to war is uh, uh, individual or collective self-defense against an armed attack. And so typically the law tries to catch up with uh, these problems. Again, I'm, uh, I'm uh, arguing really from a legal perspective um, the law often inc includes or incorporates issues of morality, religious doctrine, and so forth. Um, but from a legal perspective, there remains really universally accepted by law international lawyers only one very narrow exception to the use to going to war, that is the use of armed force, and that is in collective or individual self-defense against an armed attack. But that does not uh, equate with the reality that many countries do use armed force in uh, other situations, um, some of which may or may not be justified. You have to look at the facts from their perspective, whether a humanitarian intervention can ever justify the use of an armed force or not, uh, whether pre preemptive or anticipatory self-defense are legitimate doctrines. The argument against them, of course, is they can be manipulated to justify virtually anything. Um, but in essence, self-defense uh, is accepted in, uh, in the UN Charter, in international law. If you look at Islamic theory, uh, legal theory today, uh, most Islamic scholars argue that jihad, which uh, historically can be termed a, an Islamic just war theory, that jihad is today only uh, justifiable in self-defense consistent with the UN Charter. Of course, there are some Islamic groups that argue that uh, Western uh, aggression and Western imperialism against the Islamic world justifies a, a response beyond just an armed attack, but that's a minority view. So throughout most of the world, the UN Charter to me seems to be the only legal justification for the use of armed force, but there are certainly arguments uh, that have been promoted by other states and other people that, well, you have to expand it to things like humanitarian intervention, uh, anticipatory and preemptive self-defense. So my argument in a nutshell is war can be justified only under exceptionally narrow circumstances. That circumstance is self-defense. And uh, then of course we get into the practical issues of of when can that actually be applied or when it is it, when is it used as an excuse uh, for an armed intervention uh, where that really is not justifiable. Uh, so those are my uh, initial remarks. I have a few more remarks that I'll make at the end, of course, about what I, how I think perhaps war can be reduced if not eliminated. Uh, again, speaking primarily from a legal standpoint, and so I'm interested, of course, in David's comments and see uh, what his perspectives on, on this issue are. So I think I'm within my time limit. I haven't been, uh, <laughs> I haven't been blocked off or notified or <laughs> to say no. So I will leave my remarks at that point. We've not heard from Elliot yet. So you're within your time limits. Uh, so David Swanson, it's your turn. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can war ever be justified is a question about human choice. I am assuming that Mark and myself are both past any nonsense about war being inevitable. Every war is carefully and diligently created by human choices, even when those choices are to sit armies down in close range of each other, tell each side that the other is about to kill them and hope desperately for peace. Some human societies have never known war. Others have considered it normal, but still seen most individuals avoid it. And those who don't avoid it tend to suffer horribly. So war is evitable. 
can war ever be justified is a question about the present moment in time. It's not a question about a science fiction future. And it's only a question about the past if some past war occurred in a situation so like the present that it can suggest an example of a present war that could be justified. None, no examples offered by Mark Welton in those opening remarks other than the possible example of the horrors being committed against an occupied people by the state of Israel. Remarkable uh, to argue for the justifiability of war and offer not a single example past or future. My contention is that no side of any war can be justified today. No war could happen without the ongoing preparations for war that cannot be justified today. And that there is no war in the past for which we cannot imagine alternative actions that would have been morally superior and prevented the war. And that if we could identify a just war in the distant past, it would be unlikely to offer us any argument for a war today because the world has changed so dramatically. I think I'm speaking primarily, by no means exclusively, to people from the United States who sometimes like to defend the war for independence from England, but it is hard to compare such a war with modern warfare or to find a Canadian who regrets not having had one. Others like to defend the northern side of the US Civil War because it ended slavery, but much of the world did that without that level of bloodshed. The nonviolent means of ending slavery are perfectly imaginable and were in part acted upon, and that war did a horribly incomplete job of ending slavery. But the larger point is that if you wanted to end mass incarceration or fossil fuel use today, you wouldn't first slaughter millions of people and then pass a law to end mass incarceration. You would agree with me that it was wiser to jump straight to the legislating. Of course, 99% of the time, the candidate for a model war in the US is the US role in World War II, which Winston Churchill called the unnecessary war, which was a predictable sequel to World War I and the horrible way that first part was ended, which leading Nazis said could never have been waged in Europe without major support supplies and machinery from US corporations which followed years of Western governmental and corporate support for Nazism, plus an arms race and buildup of hostilities with Japan, which involved the US and other governments repeatedly, publicly, and for openly anti-Semitic reasons, refusing to accept the people the Nazis first wanted to expel and later to kill. But World War II, whatever you think of it, happened in a different world, without nuclear weapons, with poor understanding of nonviolent action. I'm in agreement with Mark that the world has changed. Despite the reincarnation of Hitler in the propaganda for each new war, the fact is that conquest and occupation, with glaring exceptions like Palestine or Western Sahara, have been virtually gone for longer than most of us have been alive. But what if they aren't? What if the United States is invaded or some distant country is invaded over which the US has proclaimed itself a guardian? Or what if you're looking at this from the point of view of Iraqis or Afghans or any of dozens of places that have been invaded by the US military? Don't you have the right to fight back? How should I answer that 18th century question in the 21st? It is well documented that nonviolent resistance to unjust rule, including occupations, has been more effective than violent resistance. Ask me for examples. Shouldn't you choose to use what has the best chance of succeeding, regardless of what you claim the right to use? And if you can't see yet how nonviolent resistance, plus refraining from creating enemies, would prevent invasions, you could get there by stages, starting with eliminating three quarters of the US military that has no defensive purpose, using what was left to guard the actual United States rather than the world's oil deposits or a poor country living peacefully next to Russia before NATO starts helping out. It is well documented that investing more in a military, even if you change its name to a Department of Defense, makes you less rather than more safe. Where the US has built foreign bases, it has seen more wars, not fewer. Where it has blown up people along with anyone near them with missiles, it has generated more enemies than it has killed. The war on terrorism has generated a major increase in terrorism. 
it would be bizarre for people in the US or anywhere else to think of US military spending and war preparation as justified because of either the hostility it's generating or the desire of other countries to defend themselves against it. We should be aware of what wars are. For 75 years, wars have usually been one-sided slaughters of mostly civilians. War is a leading cause of death and injury, not to mention terror, trauma, misery, homelessness, and destruction. Out of hundreds of wars in that time frame, there are only a few you're likely to hear anyone even try to morally justify. We should be aware of who's behind wars. The United States is responsible for almost 80% of foreign military weapons sales. Using a US funded list of the 50 most oppressive governments one finds the US government approves weapons shipments to 82% of them, military training to 88% funds the militaries of 66% and assists in at least one of these three ways, 96% of them. Few war-torn regions manufacture significant weapons. Few wars fail to have US-made weapons on both sides. In 2020, US military spending was more than that of the next 11 biggest spenders combined, nine of which nations were US weapons customers. The next 14 biggest spenders after those 12 were the only others to hit 1% of US military spending. And of those 14, 11 were US weapons customers. China spends 32%, Russia 8%, Iran 2%, what the US does. Of all the world's military bases on foreign soil, over 80% of them are US bases. The war business could be switched into a major reverse arms race by a single government and long since would have been if the United States had a democracy. There is nothing worse than war and no war would do more good than harm. But if one could, we have to remember that wars are fought with militaries that are built up year after year and making wars possible and likely is the least of what they do. So to justify a war, you would have to imagine one that would do more good than harm its immediate harm, its lasting harm, and the massive harm done by the preparations, the creation and maintenance of a military. Well, what's the harm in that? I'm glad you asked. All the obviously unjust wars created by keeping militaries around are the least of it. One major problem is the money. For 3% of just US military spending, you could end starvation on earth. For a bit over 1%, you could end the lack of clean drinking water on earth. For a fraction of military spending, you could put up a serious effort to slow the destruction of the climate. War and preparations for war are also top destroyers of the climate and poisoners of air, land, and water, both in the- 30 nation. seconds. They fight distant wars to benefit and everywhere they train and fight. The institution of war exists in violation of numerous treaties is why the US fails to join basic human rights treaties and the International Criminal Court is how governments justify secrecy and mass surveillance is where militarization of police starts. Keeping wars around has a major impact on culture fueling and in turn being fueled by xenophobia, bigotry and violence. Militarism endangers rather than protects those in whose name it's done. It endangers all life on earth. Without it, you could get rid of uh, nuclear weapons, which I could go you, on. I could go on. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can somewhere else, perhaps. <laughs> but, but OK, right now, what we're going to have is an opportunity. We'll uh, start Mark. Uh, we have a, for the two of you to ask each other a question. So Mark, if you have a question for David, uh, please say so, or David, if you have a question for Mark, uh, let's, I guess, have Mark go first, and then David, you'd have three minutes to respond. Yeah. Similarly, David, when if you have a question for Mark, he will have three minutes to respond, and we'll do this twice. Sure. Um, yeah, I wrote down a question I, I'd like David's opinion on, and that is, uh, in cases, and I'm talking here primarily about states against states, um, sort of the classic armed conflict scenario. So in cases of increasing tension, where there's the potential for conflict and potential for armed conflict, um, what institutions in your view either exist now or should exist that provide an avenue to resolve those tensions so that war can be prevented? 
I mean, we, um, uh, and just to elaborate briefly, we know the United Nations exists. We know there are some institutions. Do you, uh, what, what do you think about the existence of the current institutions? Are they effective? And if not, how would you like to see some structure to more to peacefully resolve tensions that might lead to war? Well, I think it's very interesting, Mark, that you suggested that there had been previous attempts to ban war, but those had failed, and so the United Nations did it. Uh, whereas, in fact, uh, every other law under the sun uh, fails. Uh, we have laws against murder, laws against drunk driving that we don't throw out upon the first incidents of, of drunk driving. Uh, in fact, the kellogg briand Pact, among other laws, we can go back to the 1899 uh, convention on the Pacific Settlement of Disputes, the 1907 Hague Convention, uh, dozens of laws, right, that are violated by every war. Uh, some of them, including the kellogg briand Pact, which are still on the books, very clearly banned all war. What the United Nations Charter did was not to ban war. It was to open up not one, but two giant loopholes for wars, uh, which are never met by any wars, but which people imagine have been met, which people imagine can make some wars legal. One of them is so-called self-defense, which is of course claimed by almost every side of almost every war. And the other is UN authorization, uh, which doesn't happen. Uh, and so I would like to see the United Nations democratized uh, I would like to see the United States one among equals as it would have been in the, in the League of Nations. I would like to see the International Criminal Court supported uh, rather than the US government punishing anyone who supports the, the international rule of law. Uh, I would like to see the support for the major human rights treaties and disarmament agreements that are out there of the 18 major human rights treaties, the United States is party to five, fewer than any other nation uh, on earth and tied with three other uh, impoverished nations. Uh, the only nation on earth not to join the con Convention on the Rights of the Child, which would ban recruiting children into militaries. Uh, you know, they, they're, are, are just why tear up and fail to join the treaty on my landmines or cluster munitions or the anti-ballistic missile treaty or the, the the comprehensive test ban treaty or you know the 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 way that you get to these situations where oh no there's tensions is by disregarding the wisdom of the people who establish these alternatives uh, and uh, ignoring it for decades. You know, or the current director of the CIA, who would never say it today, said, you expand NATO, you're choosing this war. 30 uh, seconds. Uh, thousands of people have said, so one problem is the institutions that are needed, right? Another is the, is the institutions that, are, that we need to abolish, right? And, and with the Warsaw Pact gone for 30 years, with NATO fighting foreign wars in Afghanistan and Libya, with the expansion of NATO creating the problems that NATO then will claim to solve, uh, this is one of the institutions that needs to be done away with uh, and replaced. Time. With hey, David, thank you for that response. And, and just want to remind the audience that each debater will have nine minutes at the end to provide a concluding remarks and so on. So now, David, it's your turn to ask a question of Mark Welton. And Mark, you have will have three minutes to respond. Uh, Mark, I would like to ask you to name at least one past war and at least describe at least one future war. Uh, that you would consider justified? Um, yeah. Uh, again, using my perspective that the only justification for war is self-defense, there's one clear-cut example that I can give, and that is the Iraq or Iran war of the 19, early 1980s. Now, I know that Iraq, Saddam Hussein, invaded Iran, Iranian territory. I'm also aware that the weapons that he used were acquired uh, in large part from the United States and from our head. Uh, the side who supported Iraq and who supported Saddam Hussein, that was an invasion of Iranian territory in the southern oil producing region. 
So in my opinion, Iran was justified in using armed force to repel that invasion. Uh, it was horrendous war. I'm very familiar with it. I know what the uh, repercussions were, the, the subsequent miss, raining missile, random missile attacks on Tehran by missiles that weren't even guided, they were just random. But in my opinion, that is actually today, and I'm gonna talk more about this in my concluding remarks, a rare example of a clear cut ex, uh, case of, uh, of self-defense under the United Nations Charter. And the future one? And the future one, <laughs> it, it's very hard for me to describe what a future armed attack is going to be if you take the Ukrainian example aside, and I know we could talk about a long time about Ukraine and the facts, part of my argument and, and the problem with the legal regime and talking about war in essence is that most wars in the future are not going to be cases of armed attack by one country against another. They will be more along the terms of cyber warfare, of what's called hybrid war, of low level conflict and so forth. So that to me is where the future of war is probably is primarily going to occur. Those can be equally damaging. They can be horrendous and they can cause suffering, but it's going to be a different type of war in the future. Not to say that there would not be armed attacks or armed aggression at all. And the other problem is that today, uh, most armed conflicts are in fact civil conflicts. They occur within the territory of one country. You can talk about uh, anti-colonialism, anti-imperialism, anti-imperial uh, uh, rebellions against uh, colonial powers. You can talk about civil conflicts in Africa and so forth. So a, a large majority of conflicts today are uh, internal conflicts, which is why the uh, uh, 1977 protocols to the Geneva Conventions which tried to update the Geneva Conventions. And those didn't deal with the law going to war. Those Geneva Conventions deal with trying to reduce the suffering within a, an armed conflict. The 77 Protocols had two parts, part one for international armed conflict and part two for internal armed conflict. And it was decided uh, then that something had to attempt to be done because the paradigm or the legal framework for trying to limit uh, time suffering of war was was void okay thank you mark and thank you to add now mark you have a opportunity to ask david one more question and then we'll go one more round of, with this and then we'll turn it over to some participant questions uh okay one and it's kind of related to the first question and uh, i i jotted down david's response to my first questions but clearly some nations are wealthier and much more powerful than others. Uh, um, what can the wealthy countries, and I'm, I'm thinking, okay, for example, the United States and say Western Europe, uh, what can they do to, to reduce internal armed conflicts? That is what we might call civil wars, however you wanna designate them, but they're not typical state versus state, they are, conflicts within countries that really are very devastating in places like Sub-Saharan Africa and so forth. How can, we, how can wealthier countries, besides perhaps the obvious example and that is don't sell them weapons. I know that Germany does export quite a number of weapons but under its law, it cannot export weapons to countries that are engaged in, in an armed conflict. But that doesn't mean that the, those countries will not engage in a future one. So besides simply reducing arms sales, are there other things that wealthier nations can do to minimize armed conflicts that are, are, occur so often in, I don't want to use the term less developed, but simply poorer, poorer less wealthy countries? Well, the answer you've given to your own question is, of course, sufficient. You can't have the wars without the weapons of war, and most of the places that we think of as war-torn violent regions uh, manufacture virtually no weapons like the like the liquor to the native americans and the opium into china the wars are pushed into these places by a handful of countries uh the leader being uh the united states um but you can also 
get uh, your troops uh, and your bases uh, and your mechanics and assistants and salespeople for the weapons out. Uh, as, as AFRICOM has developed, as you have moved U.S. bases into Africa, you've seen the terrorism increase, the violence violence increase, you've seen the counterproductive results of the drone killings uh, follow predictably uh, right along. Uh, you can provide other uh, services, actual aid. It's, you know, the United States talks about giving the world a decent uh, amount of aid, uh, but 40% or so of it is weapons, right? And, and for, for what is spent on this counterproductive effort, you could provide humanitarian aid uh, on an unprecedented scale. Uh, you also could lead by example. Right? There's no reason that the International Criminal Court need prosecute only Africans. There's no reason that the five biggest offenders in terms of the war industry should have veto power over everyone else at the United Nations. There's no reason not to democratize and join and support these institutions uh, and show the world that you can model uh, democracy and human rights rather than trying to bomb people in, into it. Uh, you know, you, you, you do have, you know, you, Germany's not going to send weapons to places at war, but it's, so it sends helmets, you know, it doesn't send guns and then everybody makes fun of it and it has to fire the, the head of its Navy and, and denounce Russia to, to make up for it. You know, this is, there is no reason uh, to be arming the world to the teeth uh, 30 seconds and supporting just in recent months several coups in Africa. I mean, there, there is no reason to be training the participants in so many coups uh, in, in, at a U.S. Army base in Georgia. There is no reason to be facilitating the, the overthrow, and, and there's no reason to be arming and supporting and funding and training the militaries of almost every one of the very most oppressive governments on earth. This is, this is not how you help people Time. deal with civil war. Okay, thank you, David. Now, one last round of this. David, you have an opportunity to ask Mark a question and Mark will have three minutes to respond. Anticipatory self-defense uh, in plain English uh, is also called aggression, unless you can create a distinction between the two. Um, and if war is going to be transformed into cyber war, are you now going to have actual war and call it defensive in response to someone doing damage to your computers or the allegation thereof, uh, all of this seems like a recipe for war. Uh, how do you, how, what's your distinction between supposedly defensive war uh, and anticipatory self-defense, which was exactly what Adolf Hitler thought he was engaged in? Well, as I mentioned, Preemptive self-defense and anticipatory self-defense are contested issues. International lawyers are not in agreement that these are legitimate reasons to use armed force and self-defense because they have the, uh, the capacity or inherent ability for any country to justify uh, an attack and say that it is in anticipation of an attack against it. Um, in reading the doctrine, Israeli doctrine, armed forces doctrine on anticipatory self-defense, which is the doctrine that to my understanding, having talked uh, to the judge advocate general of the Israeli defense forces, that is a, an accepted doctrine that uh, because in that particular case, Israel is surrounded by enemies who have uh, as their sworn doctrine, the elimination of the state of Israel. And therefore, uh, they believe that if they do not act in anticipation of aggression against it, that that aggression is basically designed to exterminate the country itself. And therefore, they need to act because of their geographic location, uh, 
And because they are surrounded by enemies, they need to act in anticipation of, of that. Now, there are problems with that, as I mentioned. Uh, how far in advance? What kind of evidence do you need that you are about to be attacked, either attacked generally or with overwhelming force? Um, so there are issues there and Israeli scholars have debated those issues, but I'm, I'm throwing that out as an example of one country that follows this doctrine and it believes it needs to follow this doctrine uh, because as, uh, as this article again, uh, or not article, but uh, as explained by the uh, genocide prevention program, program at Hebrew University, um, the defense of the, the right to life and security, and I'm quoting from an article, the right to life and security are core values that override all others. And in their opinion, the security of the state of Israel and the lives of Israelis depends upon anticipating uh, an attack that is designed to exterminate the country. So that, that's an example, um, but it is subject to abuse and that's why it's a contested issue. So I, I do not support it in every case, but I recognize it that some countries um, and, some, and many scholars agree that that is a, an acceptable doctrine. Hey, thank you, um, Mark, for that response. And, uh, and Elliot didn't need to call 30, 30 second time limit. Um, now, if Greta has some, uh, what we've done folks is to try to consolidate the questions that were coming in through the chat into one or two questions and to keep things moving along in terms of the time frames. I'm gonna, I, I think we need to limit the response time to two minutes. So Elliot, set your mental timekeeper to uh, two minutes for each response. And Greta, uh, we'll, we'll try to do two questions from the uh, participants that Greta has uh, put together. Yeah, well, thank you, everyone. There are just so many questions coming in. Um, we certainly won't be able to get to all of it. I really appreciate all of the questions and dialogue coming through. Um, but we've got to ask the big one, which I think you all knew was coming, which is World War II. Um, and, you know, World War II is often considered the good war, the justifiable war. Was it really? Which one of us is answering this? <laughs> Uh, David, you go first. If you, I just made that up, two minutes. Uh, so uh, the the answer is in a book called "Leaving World War II Behind," written by me. Uh, but because nobody read books, reads books, I still have to try to answer it uh, everywhere I speak in two minutes. Um, uh, First of all, uh, the reason that most people give uh, for thinking that uh, has to do with the mythology that the wagers of World War II from the side of the US, UK, et cetera, had in mind something related to preventing the horrors of Nazism. Whereas in fact, in reality, they had held numerous public conferences and decided not to accept uh, into virtually any country on earth, virtually any of the people threatened uh, by Nazism. Uh, and peace activists went to the US State Department and the Foreign Secretary in the UK over and over again and said, evacuate these people. Uh, and the answer always given was, we can't be bothered, we're busy fighting a war. The answer discussed privately was always, my God, how embarrassing that would be to our allies because Hitler would agree to that and nobody wants these people. Uh, and so so the, the justification in the mythology was invented only after the war, as often is the case. Uh, and of course, the war killed several times the number of people killed in the camps. Uh, so the cure versus the disease is a problem. Uh, it, it also, again, was a completely unnecessary war. You could have taken completely obvious steps that people said should be taken from the moment World War I was ended, uh, but they were not taken. Uh, and, and of course, a, a lot of the mythology related to Nazism, uh, it, you know, it, it ignores the fact uh, that the that the eugenics and the philosophy was developed largely in the United States. Uh, that the Nazis came over and studied how to do racist segregation. Uh, that the Nazis had the funding and support of major U.S. corporations and said it was absolutely critical. Uh, 
Um, and you didn't you didn't have to have that prioritization of of the the Soviet Union as the enemy leading up to and even through the war with it as the ally. Um, you, you also didn't have to have the long, steady buildup protested by peace rallies for years and years toward war with Japan. Uh, whereas we have this, you know, manufactured memory of the United States and uh, uh, sitting innocently by having tea and being attacked out of the blue. Uh, this war was the very worst thing that humanity has done to itself uh, in any short space of time, uh, in, in terms of, of life, injury, trauma, environmental devastation, creation of horrible precedents and institutions, et cetera. Uh, and, and so you have to propose something, uh, you have to propose something worse. You know, what could have Hi. been worse? Hi. Okay, uh, thank you, David. Uh, Mark, two um, minutes to respond to the question from the audience. About World War II? I know the term good war has been used. Uh, there is no good war. Uh, there may be, on rare occasions, justifiable war. And I, I've explained my position on that. There's no good war. And uh, I agree with some of what David said. Um, world War II uh, was really an outgrowth of the complete failure of World War I to solve the situation. I mean, uh, I was a German studies major in college, and I'm familiar with the growth of Nazism and the, uh, what the Allies did after World War I, both colonialism and uh, to, to Germany, really fed the roots of the growth of uh, fascism and, and the Nazi party. Um, so I do not disagree at all that World War II could have been prevented with reasonable diplomacy and reasonable statesmanship after the First World War. And we can talk later about the First World War. Uh, my only point of, I think my point of disagreement and not calling it a good war was um, when Hitler, when the Germans actually started to annex uh, parts, uh, well, the Anschluss with Austria and then annex the Sudetenland and then actually invade Poland those were armed aggressions and Hitler used uh, in, in, in his writings, basically uh, one of the things that I mentioned at the outset, which was protection of nationals, that these were places inhabited mostly by Germans and the Germans were being oppressed and um, therefore it justified uh, the Anschluss, it justified the annexation of the Sudetenland and then the invasion of Poland and then the subsequent invasion of other countries. Once those invasions occurred, then there was justification to fight against the Axis powers. But leading up to that, certainly it could have been prevented, but that does not eliminate, I think, the justification for, uh, for going to war against fascism and against the Axis powers once those invasions actually occurred. Uh, and I know it was a result of the treaties and so forth. And I know that World War I was really a consequence of all of these misguided treaties and alliances and so forth. But the bottom line is World War II was fought uh, at the end of the story when it began. Uh, it was justified to oppose fascism and Nazism. Hi. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Elliot. Thank you, Mark Welton, for that response. Greta, what is the next question? And again, we'll have two minutes for each uh, debater to respond. Yeah, so another controversial question that uh, divides the anti-war movement, I think, in some ways I've seen this, and this has come in from a few different people, essentially, um, would indigenous communities be justified in taking their land back through warfare, or another way that it was worded, would indigenous peoples around the world have the right to armed self-defense when imperialists invade? Should I keep going first? Should we alternate? What, who's... Let's, let's have Mark go first this time. Sure. Um, that, that can occur in a couple of scenarios. One is an indigenous people are contesting a foreign imperial power either a domestic government that is supported by a foreign imperial power that is oppressing them, or uh, within uh, the country itself, indigenous people are being oppressed and suppressed, or even possibly uh, exterminated in, in some sense uh, by, by the dominant 
government by the dominant people. And um, that is an area, as I've mentioned before, that the UN Charter really didn't contemplate very much uh, in, in terms of our self-defense against an armed attack uh, by another state. So are they justified? Um, <laughs> I understand, for instance, that uh, nonviolent, uh, nonviolent action uh, led by Gandhi in India resulted in the uh, abandonment of the United Kingdom, of Great Britain from uh, India as a colonial power, and that was successful. Can that be, is that a better model for other uh, oppressed peoples um, as opposed to armed violence? I, I hesitate to put myself in that position because I'm not in that position. And it, it's almost presumptuous of me to put myself in the place of an indigenous person or group that is being oppressed because I am not such a person. Um, I think that anytime you can use nonviolent means to, uh, to assert your rights and to oppose oppression, is preferable to armed uh, resort to arms. But I'm very hesitant to put myself in that position because I think it's somewhat presumptuous of me. So my answer is nonviolent action is always preferable, but it may not, you may not have the situation, for instance, that Gandhi had in India, where the United Kingdom was going to, was basically bankrupt after World War II and had to abandon its colonial empire anyway. Uh, and so, as we know, in Southeast Asia, uh, anti-colonialism took the form of armed resistance against the French and other colonial powers. Uh, David Swanson, response I, to the question? Yeah, I, I believe it is arrogant and presumptuous to go uninvited and insist that people do as I command. Uh, I do not think it is arrogant in the slightest to give advice or opinion when asked for it. Uh, and my opinion when asked for it uh, is that organized mass killing uh, is not only destructive of the environment in a way that most indigenous societies have the wisdom to see beyond, uh, is not only incredibly immoral, is not only illegal, is not only uh, risking of the ending of all life on earth as wars can spiral out of control and nuclear weapons are uh, on the table at this point, it is also counterproductive uh, in that Gandhi is not the only example uh, of struggle uh, over the past hundred years. If you look at the studies that have been done and share the knowledge that has been developed of hundreds of principally nonviolent and principally violent struggles against oppressive domestic governments and against occupations and invasions, both fail all the time, but the nonviolent ones succeed over twice as often as the violent ones. Those successes are far longer lasting. There is far less often a blowback and cycles uh, of conflict, uh, you are far better off. And so I hope to, well, I'm going to start reading and maybe I'll only get through one or two from a list of dozens of examples uh, going beyond Gandhi and India, uh, Lebanon. 30 years of Syrian domination ended through a large scale nonviolent uprising in 2005. Germany, 1920, a coup overthrew and exiled the government, but on its way out, the government called for a general strike and the coup was undone in five days. Algeria, 1961, four French generals stage a coup, nonviolent resistance undoes it in a few days. Soviet Union, 1991, Gorbachev arrested, tanks sent to major cities, media shut down, protests banned, nonviolent protest ends the coup in a few days. The first Palestinian Intifada in the 1980s, much of the subjugated population effectively becomes self-governing entities through nonviolent non-cooperation. Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia free themselves from Soviet occupation through nonviolent resistance prior to the USSR's collapse. Nonviolent resistance in Western Sahara forces Morocco to offer an autonomy proposal. In the final years of the journey. All right. All right. 
Thank you, uh, David. And now I think we're at the point where uh, uh, we're going to have closing remarks from each of you. So since, if you don't mind, since Mark, you went first uh, before, how about if we have David Swanson with his closing remarks? And then Mark, you thought we'll follow David. You each have nine minutes for those closing remarks and Elliot will keep the time. Uh, sounds good. Thank you. Uh, thank you to Mark. Thank you to Al, everyone who's been here. I wish we could go on for hours. As you can tell, I have more to say every time I get cut off. It's interesting that any other institution under the sun, if someone were to try to justify it, they would offer endless examples of it that they thought were justified. With war, it's like pulling teeth. Uh, I'm, I'm sincerely grateful to Mark that I didn't get the, the irrelevant analogies about muggings in dark alleys and so forth. Usually nobody wants to talk about war at all. Here I heard two examples. One was the Iran-Iraq war. Interesting, a war where the, the United States government has supported both sides and, and principally the, the side that Mark depicted as the aggressor and the unjustified side. Uh, if that's it, hey, let's shut down the U.S. military. If it hasn't had any justifiable wars and we can't imagine it having any in the foreseeable future, let's shut it down. The world will follow the reverse arms race, the conversion process, the shifting of resources to where they are really needed. Because this is the thing I, that Mark didn't say one word in response to. You have to justify not just a war, but the institution of war, the diversion of resources, the environmental damage, the damage to self-governance, the damage to the rule of law, the damage to a culture and a society. Example number two was Israel, a government engaged in brutal genocidal wars against an occupied people and running an apartheid state justified because of its special status. I, I mean, and, and bombing families, killing little children in the name of the right to life. This is the justification for the institution of war. I'm not, I'm not sold. Uh, the the, the nonviolent examples that I started to go through the list, they're endless. The, this, you know, they're available to Iran if it's attacked. They're available to everyone if they're developed. If either the United States or Russia had invested in Ukraine, not in trying to win people to its side, but in developing the skills of nonviolent non-cooperation, Ukraine would be incapable of being occupied. Uh, I, I also think Ukraine brings to mind this problem of anticipatory self-defense, which both sides think they are engaged in. This problem of the imminent attack, which we had lawyers under the, the George W. Bush and the Barack Obama administrations redefine the word imminent to mean Hell, I don't know, maybe someday. And they're acting on that. They're acting on that. They're engaging in self-defense because of an attack they simply declare to be imminent. You know, there was no NATO created after World War I, and there couldn't have been. It was too similar to what created World War I, binding countries to join in any war that other countries get into is madness. And this is what created World War I. I think there's this notion that people have that the norm is, is war and you have to work for peace and war just seems to break out as the phrase is, come like the weather, where in fact the norm is peace and you have to work really, really hard for a considerable amount of time to get a war going. This is what we're seeing right now in Europe. Uh, you, you can go through the examples and maybe I'll start reading through some of them and see how many I can get through. But Mexico was willing to negotiate the sale of its northern half. The United States wanted to take it through an act of mass killing. Spain wanted the matter of the main to go to international arbitration. The U.S. preferred war and empire. The Soviet Union proposed peace negotiations before the Korean War. The Korean War very much resembling this, uh, what's happening in Ukraine, where it's not clear who's starting it, but both sides are sure they know who's starting it. But one side had no business being in that continent. Uh, 
the United States sabotaged peace proposals for Vietnam from the Vietnamese, from the Soviets, and from the French, relentlessly insisting on its, quote, last resort over any other possibility. From the day the Gulf of Tonkin incident mandated war, despite never having occurred. Before the Gulf War, the Iraqi government was willing to negotiate withdrawal from Kuwait without war and ultimately offered to simply withdraw from Kuwait within three weeks without conditions. The King of Jordan, the Pope, the President of France, the President of the Soviet Union, and many others urged such a peaceful settlement. The White House insisted instead upon its so-called last resort. Everyone supposes the U.S. invaded Afghanistan in 2001 and stayed there 20 years as some series of ongoing recurring last resorts, even though the Taliban had offered to turn bin Laden over to a third country to stand trial. Prior to the war on Iraq uh, 2003 edition, the U.S. president had been concocting cockamamie schemes to get a war started. The Iraqi government had approached the CIA's Vincent, Vincent Canistrato to offer to let US troops search the entire country. The Iraqi government had offered to hold internationally monitored elections. The Iraqi government offered Bush, according to uh, offered Bush official Richard Pearl to open the whole country to inspections, to turn over a suspect in the 93 World Trade Center bombing, to join in fighting terrorism, and to favor U.S. oil companies. The Iraqi president offered in the account that the president of Spain was given by the U.S. president, president to simply leave Iraq if he could keep $1 billion. Sounds outrageous, but anybody remember what the war cost? Uh, even setting aside the general practices that increase hostility, provide weaponry, empower militaristic governments, as well as fake negotiations intended to facilitate rather than avoid war, the history of war making can be traced back through the centuries as a story of an endless series of opportunities for peace carefully avoided. To get back to some counterexamples, when the French and Belgian troops occupied the Ruhr in 1923, the German government called on its citizens to resist without physical violence. People nonviolently turned public opinion in Britain, the US, and even in Belgium and France in favor of the occupied Germans. By international agreement, the French troops were withdrawn. These are techniques, these are tools available to Ukraine and the rest of the world. In the ending years of the German occupation of Denmark and Norway during World War II, the Nazis effectively no longer controlled those populations. Nonviolent movements have removed US military bases from places like Ecuador and the Philippines. When the Soviet military invaded Czechoslovakia in 68, there were demonstrations, a general strike, a refusal to cooperate, the removal of street signs, the persuasion of troops. And despite clueless leaders conceding, the takeover was slowed down and the credibility of the Soviet Communist Party was destroyed. You know, anything that you can stretch to call war uh, is likely very recent in human prehistory and history and sporadic throughout US his throughout world history. Uh, as some of us find it very hard to imagine a world without war or violence, uh, there have been people interviewed in Malaysia and numerous spots around the globe from societies that couldn't comprehend the idea of war or of murder or of rape. Uh, you have to be taught these things. They have to exist in your culture. They're not in your DNA. So we look at places like Costa Rica and Iceland and all the tiny countries with no militaries, the places like Switzerland with, with neutrality uh, firmly adhered to, and we think, you know, that's, that's not possible. That's not human nature. And yet there isn't any other country on earth that isn't closer to Costa Rica's zero dollars a year for its military than to the United States military budget. The United States is that much of an outlier driving this enterprise. Um, I, I think it's worth noting how counterproductive on its own terms war is. Uh, according to the Washington Post, then President Trump asked the Secretary of so-called Defense, James Mattis, why he would send troops to Afghanistan. And Mattis replied, to prevent a bombing in Times Square. 
And yet, ironically enough, the man who had tried to blow up Times Square in 2010 had said he was trying to get U.S. troops out of Afghanistan. In 2014, a Gallup poll of 65 nations found the United States to be far and away the country considered the largest threat to peace in the world. If this is what you get out of the biggest military, let's go for the smallest military. A Pew poll in 2017 found majorities in most countries viewing the United States as a threat. Any other nation hoping to match the US in these polls would need to wage a lot more so-called defensive wars before it could generate the same levels of fear and resentment. It's not just the world outside the US or even outside the US military that's aware of this problem. It's become almost routine for US military commanders, usually just after retiring, to argue that various wars or tactics are creating more new enemies than the enemies they are killing. Almost all, 99.5% of terrorist attacks occur in countries engaged in wars and or engaged in abuses such as imprisonment without trial, torture, or lawless killing. There's an easy solution to this. The highest rates of terrorism are in liberated and democratized Iraq and Afghanistan, have been for years. The terrorist groups responsible for the most terrorism, that is non-state politically motivated violence around the world, have grown out of U.S. wars against terrorism. According to Peace Science Digest, quote, deployments of troops to another country increases the chance of attacks from terror organizations from that country. Weapons exports to another country increase the chance of attacks from terror organizations from that country. 95% of all suicide terrorist attacks are conducted to encourage foreign occupiers to leave the terrorists' home country. The wars on Iraq and Afghanistan and the abuses of prisoners during them became major recruiting tools for anti-US terrorism. In 2006, a US intelligence, the US intelligence agencies, as they are misnamed, produced a national intelligence estimate that reached just that conclusion. The Associated Press reported, the war in Iraq has become a cause celeb for Islamic extremists breeding deep resentment of the US that probably will get worse before it gets better, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Jumping ahead, a, store, a study of nations that participated in the war on Afghanistan uh, found that in proportion to the number of troops they sent there, they experienced terrorist blowback. So the war on terrorism reliably and predictably produced amounts of terrorism. Veterans of U.S. kill teams in Iraq and Afghanistan interviewed in by Jeremy Scahill. It's more than enough time. I'm sorry, David. It's it's about two minutes over. I will apologize, but I didn't know. Uh, so <laughs> sorry, sorry. All right, uh, sorry. Uh, thank you, David and Mark Welton. Your uh, chance for uh, your closing remarks in nine minutes. Sure. Um, there's a lot of what David has said in the past hour that I am completely in agreement with. Um, I still believe that there are, can, in very limited circumstances, be wars that are justified in self-defense. A lot of what David has talked about, and much of which I agree with, uh, is how you reduce war, uh, how you can limit it. Uh, not whether it can ever be justified, but how you can get to the point where war becomes less and less frequent and common. Um, again, from my legal perspective, and that's sort of the profession that I grew up in, uh, he mentioned things like support for the International Criminal Court to resolve disputes, uh, U.S. support for international agreements, which the U.S. has a, a, a recently a, a pretty bad record on. Uh, I fully support U.S. participation in all of those. I support international tribunals uh, like the International Criminal Court and ad hoc tribunals uh, to resolve conflicts, uh, to prevent those conflicts from devolving into war. So I think there are certainly steps that can be taken uh, to reduce uh, the possibility of war. And I think U.S. needs to take the lead uh, in, in which I think we have done periodically in the past, but not in the recent past, take the lead in promoting those. Um, perhaps to my experience, the best model uh, to prevent war uh, 
grew out of World War II, and that was the creation of the European Union, because the European Union was constituted a few years after World War II as the European coal and steel community. And it was done that primarily because at that time, coal and steel were the instruments of war. And by putting coal and steel production into a supranational institution that neither none of the member countries, including Germany, could control, you would reduce you would reduce or perhaps eliminate the possibility of those countries going to war because they wouldn't have the means to do so. That they, they then included the atomic community. And then of course the European Union group into the European community became an economic community. But again, these supranational institutions in Western Europe uh, took a lot of the national decision-making and possibility of going to war out of the picture and so integrated the economies of those countries that war became basically unthinkable. Now, the recent expansion of the European Union has caused problems. So I'm speaking primarily about the 50s, 60s and 70s, but that kind of a, a model where countries uh, forego uh, or put outside of direct uh, national control over the means of warfare is one way uh, to prevent war and the EC was a model. Now the problem is of course, can you take the European uh, example and can you put it in other regions and other places? Uh, there have been some attempts to do so. I fully support those attempts. I don't know if the history and, and all of the uh, intangibles that go that would, would make those countries uh, cooperate to the extent that the Europeans did after the Second World War. I don't know if that's possible, but it's certainly worth the attempt because to my way of thinking, just from a practical standpoint, the way to stop war is to uh, so integrate uh, countries, eco economies and the means to go to war that um, you substantially, I think, reduce it. But that's one example that came actually out of the war. The problem going forward, Again, uh, if you take my position that legally the only justifiable war is in self-defense under the UN Charter, um, then of course we have problems going forward in the future. Um, most warfare in the future, not all, but most warfare is not gonna be armed conflict by one country against another. It's probably going to be low level conflict, uh, uh, cyber warfare, that type of thing. And that's going to be difficult to control. It's not gonna require large armies in the future, uh, but it can be equally devastating. So there needs to be an international regime uh, and a cooperation bilateral or multilateral to try to minimize the damage that can be done uh, by cyber warfare and those sorts of low level types of warfare. And then finally, um, in the future, uh, I'm skeptical that war is going to be eliminated and I'm skeptical because I think the causes of war uh, are beginning to shift. Uh, territorial uh, conquest uh, is not going to be a primary motivator of war in the future. Uh, I think things like climate change. I think climate change is uh, a potential disaster for the world and it's a disaster for the world that is going to create or lay the seeds for armed conflict. Because as populations move, uh, as rivers dry up in Iran, the major uh, three major rivers in Iran now are completely dry. In, uh, Latin, in, in uh, Central America, you have large population movements because of climate change into cities, which are gonna create stresses domestically. They're gonna create stresses between uh, ethnic groups, religious groups, and that can easily simmer into internal armed conflict, which as we know, uh, particularly in places like the Middle East, but elsewhere can spill across national boundaries and draw in big powers and create the scenario for a much wider uh, armed conflict. So I think uh, in the future, um, greater international cooperation, uh, a, a real effort by the United States to get re-engaged in international agreements and international tribunals and efforts to resolve confl uh, conflicts nonviolently, and efforts to look at what are going to be the potential causes of warfare in the future, of which I would place climate change uh, 
certainly very close to the top of the list. Uh, so my concluding remark is uh, <laughs> there is no such thing as a good war period ever. There has never been a good war. Uh, war still can legally be justified, but the best uh, things, uh, I think every, I applaud any effort to create the institutions and the focus on things that will reduce the possibility of war, uh, particularly going forward into the future. All right, thanks to uh, both of David and to Mark. And uh, um, Greta, do you wanna show that, uh, the uh, run the, the question again, the polling question? Yep, I've just launched the post-debate poll. So everyone, please take a look at that and start voting. We'll keep it open a little bit longer. I see responses yeah. coming. And then Greta, you're going to show the uh, the first the result of the first question, or, and then we, so we can compare that to the the second time we ask the question. Is yep. That, okay. Yeah. Oh, I see that the poll. Yeah, the poll ended. I don't know why it did that, but yeah. I'm just going to uh, show the results at this point. So I'll show the results for the first one. I think the second one got a lot fewer people doing it. Yeah. As folks can see, a uh, 22 percent said yes. War can be justified. 47% said no, 31% said not sure at the beginning of the, uh, there, before we actually conducted the debate. And then the, well, we didn't have as many results come in on the second question. Yeah, I think, you know what, I think I'm going to relaunch it because I'm seeing a lot of people where it stops. So let me relaunch the okay. post-debate poll. Um, so there it goes, it is open. And if you voted before, just vote again since I relaunched it. Hmm. They have to be registered, don't they? Um, hmm. It ended again, yeah, I was, I'm sorry. That, I would ask that, was an election, speakers, that was an election joke. I would ask all the speakers to not vote. That is what is interrupting it. So the people who presented debates, please do not vote and please do not touch the poll. I believe that is what is interrupting it. Yeah, I have touched nothing at the beginning <laughs> or the ending. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Let's try it one more time. <laughs> Here we go. Thanks everyone, we see 80% participation. Can we get that higher? All right, I think we can close it out at this point. Thanks everyone. So there's the results. Al, do you wanna, I'm gonna show it. Do you wanna read off those results? So this is the second time this was asked, correct? Yep. Yep, okay, so 20% said yes, war can be justified. 62% uh, said no, and 18% said uh, not sure. I think that compares within the, the first time we asked the question uh, was 44%, or excuse, right, 44% for yes. What was it? Uh, no, it was it was 22, which turned into 20, which is not a major change. And then it was 47, which turned into 62, which is a significant change. And then it was 31, which dropped to 18. Uh, okay. So it seems mostly there were more people who were sure. Uh, <laughs> All right. Thank you, David, for uh, for tracking the math there.
Uh, and then we're also interested in the uh, the second question there in terms of the uh, rate from one to five, whether it's been informative and we're pleased to see that 74% of you said it was highly informative, 19% uh, said, uh, said uh, rated it four. Uh, so the, we're pleased that folks have appeared to think this is an informative uh, event for you and that uh, folks learned something from it. Um, I want to uh, thank uh, Greta for all of her help on this and, and Elliot for, uh, for the work he did as the timekeeper and all of the participants uh, from across around the world who uh, joined this event. Um, and mostly and obviously I wanna thank David Swanson and Mark Welton for uh, the, the work you did in putting your, your uh, very informative uh, positions together and for uh, sharing uh, some very important information with uh, with all of us. So, and Al uh, Mitty, thank you to Al Mitty. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, so, it, David, David, and Mark, we have a we have a couple of minutes left. If you'd like to make any kind of closing comments, I don't mean the long dissertation, but uh, something else, uh, very briefly, you'd like to say to the audience while you have an audience here. Um, no, I, I have not read David's books, but I intend to, and uh, I found his comments very informative, and, um, you know, I'm always looking for different opinions. Um, so anything I can do to enlighten myself and become more informed, I'm interested in. And uh, so I intend to read his books, at least one, if not several. And um, I don't know, David, if you can recommend, if I were going to read one, which should I read? <laughs> Which, which of my babies do I like? It's a tough, uh, tough question, but appropriate for a war <laughs> scenario. Um, I, 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 guess, uh, I, I guess leaving World War II behind is one that came up in this, uh, in this um, but I recommend all of my books as most authors do. And I would highly value uh, your critiques, Mark, whether you're persuaded by them or not. Uh, I, I think that those would be very valuable. Um, and I imagine and there were a lot of people who had a lot of questions uh, that didn't get asked since like two questions got asked. Um, my email is david at worldbeyondwar.org. Uh, I promise to do my best to answer your questions. Um, but if there are too many and there are things I've written books about, that's why people write books. <laughs> so, uh, you know, please, please uh, read. You all, you all are obviously a very... Uh, informed and intelligent uh, crowd to begin with. So um, I think you can you can read books. And we will email out the recording afterwards. It will be posted on YouTube so you can share it. Um, and there's been a few requests for transcripts. We can see what we can do about that. Perhaps Mark and David might be willing to share some of their remarks in, in text form. Sure. I'll see what I can do. I did not write down, I wrote notes, so I did not write any text. So um, I could perhaps do an outline if, okay. nothing, if nothing else. Mark, Mark, you could sell them. I could sell them. <laughs> <laughs> it was an evil attempt at humor. It, his, his, you gotta buy his, mine are free. What's this? <laughs> <laughs> So, all right, well, Mark, thank you very much, David. Thank you very much, Greta. Thank you very much, Elliot. Thanks, and uh, thanks to all who uh, joined this this uh, session and, and uh, this webinar. So with that, I think we'll close her down. Okay. Thank, thank you, you yeah. And I've yeah. seen yeah, some remarks about the Zoom transcript. The Zoom captions are not very accurate, um, so we won't be sending those out, but YouTube will be generating its own captions, which are better quality, um, so you can expect those on the video. Thank you, Greta. Right. Thank you. Thanks, right. everybody. Thanks, everyone. Have okay. a good one. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.